Welcome everyone. I'm Jeremy Druin, manager of the library's Missouri Valley Special Collections. Thank you for joining us for another online installment of our Signature Sunday series. Today's talk is about baseball, specifically Kansas City Blues baseball. By way of background, the Blues were a founding member of the American Association in 1902 and were Kansas City's professional baseball team, along with the Monarchs of the Negro Leagues for the next five decades. The franchise was a farm club of the New York Yankees organization from 1936 through 54, winning league uh, championships, uh, four league championships during that span. Although they also had some not so successful seasons, unfortunately. It was in 1950 when an unlikely turn of events led to 14 year old Ed Fitzgerald getting a job with his hometown baseball team, a dream of any young fan. In his book, Summer with the Blues, he reflects on that memorable season of his, of his youth, working long double headers, building grounders before home games, and playing catch with future Hall of Famers. Fitzgerald is a native Kansas Cityan and lifelong KC sports fan. He graduated from Willis High School and Rockhurst University before earning a law degree from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Fitzgerald practiced law for over 60 years before retiring in 2015. He also served five years as assistant prosecuting attorney for Jackson County, Missouri. He's been married to his wife, Barbara, for over 60 years, and they have five children and 10 grandchildren. Joining us this afternoon is local author, historian, and promoter of all things Irish in Kansas City, Pat O'Neill. A retired publicist and copywriter, O'Neill co-founded the Kansas City Irish Festival and is the current president of the Kansas City Irish Center. In 2000, he published the authoritative book on Kansas City's Irish history titled From the Bottom Up. Be on the lookout for his newest book, Ted Sullivan, Barnacle of Baseball, due out in September. Sullivan was truly a fascinating and unique character and had ties to early Kansas City baseball. Ed and Pat, thank you for being here. I will turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I introduced myself as a 85 year old Kansas Cityan. I've been here all my life. And uh, I started writing this book when I was 84, which uh, takes some confidence uh, that you're gonna finish it. But nevertheless, uh, I did. Uh, I, I started out by telling my grandkids and my kids about this remarkable summer of 1950. And finally, <clears throat> one of my grandkids, uh, Megan, suggested that I write maybe I could write a book and send her a chapter. So uh, I did in fact uh, send a chapter to her and a little outline and she was very excited about it. But of course she's a grandchild. I, I expect her to be excited about it. But 175 pages later, I finished the book. So the book is about <clears throat> this fantastic, but almost lucky and happenstance summer that I had in 1950. And uh, and and uh, the the almost pure luck that happened with me throughout this time. I I uh, so uh, uh, Megan got the book and uh, I finished it and here here we are. Ed, I've got uh, I I love the uh, the the first line of your book, which just what kind of hooks me right in and it kind of kind of sums it all up. You say when. You, when you're 14 years old, things just happen. And these things happen to you. And I don't know if it was just Irish luck or what would you call it? Well, I would call it pure Irish luck because there is no reason at all that anything like this would ever possibly happen to me. There's absolutely no reason whatsoever. You were, you were, you were 14 years old. You lived, you grew up in, like I did in, in old town, midtown, 39th street and went to St. James School, and you played a little ba baseball on the school team, and also it was one of your first loves. So that just happened to dovetail with the with the job of a lifetime, huh? I, yeah, I love baseball. I love playing baseball. Uh, our the, the picture you see is our 1949 St. James uh, baseball team. 
uh, none of the, well, I should say that one of the guys could afford cleats, but nobody else had any. Uh, our record was uh, very poor, but everybody liked to play, particularly me. We loved baseball. <laughs> well, what did, you know, how, did, how did it all come about? How did you end up with this job that every boy, every 14-year-old kid in the city would have loved to have had? Well, it came about really and truly because my father was an alcoholic and that sounds crazy, but nevertheless, uh, he was drinking beer at Shorty's Bar at 40th and Truce one day. And uh, <clears throat> he came across the, a man, John Travi, who was the, uh, who graduated from Notre Dame and who was the assistant general manager for the blues. And so <clears throat> dad came home one night and said, uh, uh, would you like to be the bad boy for the Kansas City Blues? Well, hell yes, I'd like to be the bad boy for the Kansas City Blues. Who wouldn't want to be the bad boy for the Blues? Uh, you know, that, that the Blues was the greatest, as far as I was concerned, at 14, the greatest team in baseball. I mean, they were so good, they even broadcast their games on radio. So Before TV uh, broadcast. So, of course, I wanted to be the bad boy. So well, Now, tell me, but I remember, I remember John Travi, and he was like an assistant manager of the Blues, I think, at the time, a young guy, but he was like big, tall guy, six foot five, six foot six, went, went to Notre Dame. Yeah, he went to Notre Dame and was on the Notre Dame uh, intramural boxing team as a heavyweight at six foot four or six five, as you say, and 240 pounds, yeah. which was which was, I was, I'm talking to him at this time at 14 and I'm five foot tall. There was a quite a distinction between our ages and heights. So anyway, <laughs> but he, was a, he was a great guy. He could have been in his pocket. <laughs> Cause how, yeah. how big were you at 14? I was five foot tall. Five foot tall and what? A, uh, not, and not 98 pounds. 98 pounds? That might have been stretching it, I think, from judging for no Well, thing. I always like to add a few pounds <laughs> to my weight. So nobody would think I was a few. <laughs> Well, you know, we talk. You, you and I both grew up in that in that general neighborhood. I was baptized at that that St. James, and you went to St. James. I was St. Francis. But that whole Catholic education and the connections with people like Travi at, at Shorty's Bar, you know, all those things kind of come together, right? That influence your life. What the, how how about growing up in that neighborhood and at St. James? Oh it, well, it was great. I love I love St. James. Uh, it's a great school. They uh, the uh, but I have to say that the Catholic Church had me under its thumb from the time I got in there at the kindergarten. The, uh, the first grade, we all made our first first communion, and we had to make our first communion. Of course, we had to, uh, to receive the Immaculate Body of Christ. We had to make our first confession, and ah, yeah. first confession was pretty tough for uh, first graders because uh, you couldn't really count on the, any of the Ten Commandments to confess to anybody. Uh, none of uh, none of our <clears throat> my classmates were uh, going to confess to coveting their neighbor's wife or neighbor's goods. Although years later, I have to admit, some of my classmates were pretty good at coveting their neighbor's wife and coveting their neighbor's goods. In <laughs> fact, sometimes in the same doesn't, you know? <laughs> Don't name names, okay? No, no, there's no, no names. <laughs> What's so, so, but it, you and I talked about this one day that, you know, there are sins that only Catholics can commit. Yeah, you're, yeah, you have to be a Catholic to commit certain sins. You can't, for instance, uh, eating meat on Friday is a sin if you're a Catholic. Uh, not, not attending Mass on Sunday, that's a sin if you're a Catholic. We have a lot of sins. So <laughs> looking for a sin if you're a Catholic is not hard to do. Uh, and, and the problem with some of the sins is, the nuns told us on, on even on go, uh, eating uh, eating fish on Friday, that all those sins, if you if you committed them and you 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 died with that sin on your soul, you're bound to go to hell forever. So it sure. was it was a, a major uh, problem in everybody's life because of the, the consequences of committing one of those sins. And so, but I was able to overcome that through my life without it. <laughs> Now you now we'll go back to baseball, Ed. You you start out as the ball boy, and what I always wondered to go sounds like a great job, but what does a ball boy do? <clears throat> well, it's it's absolutely the worst job in baseball. Uh, the boy boy sits on a 
on a folding chair outside of the clubhouse in 1950. And there's a special type of mud that was rubbed on balls because ball players don't like these these new slick mud. So uh, uh, so you rub this mud on these balls, and uh, then when the umpire asks for a ball, you bring the ball into you give the ball into the umpire. It's a simple enough job to do, but uh, in my research, I found in one game in 19, uh, 2020 uh, that in the major leagues, they used 110 balls in one game because the balls are used, you know, any foul ball comes out of the game. Uh, anytime the ball hits the, anything that the screen or hits the post or hits the ground or in fact, if the umpire just notices any defect at all in the ball, it's thrown out of the game. And if the pitcher, for no reason whatsoever, says, I want a new ball, then he gets it. And the the thing is that uh, all those balls that they want have to be rubbed with mud. And now they have a machine that rubs mud on the ball. But in 1950, I was that machine. I you, mean, that machine. you called it the worst job in baseball. It, right? it was absolutely the worst job in baseball. And, and on top of it, it was the worst paying job because it paid a, a dollar a, a day, not a dollar a game. So on a double header, you only got to, uh, you only got one dollar, and and with the dollar, I couldn't hardly support my fourteen-year-old habits. So you know, eating, uh, getting a malt at the country club, or or at getting a hamburger at the snack shop, or even going to the famous Colonial Theater at Thirty Eighth and Woodland. I mean, I couldn't afford that with with the dollar uh, a game uh, pay. It was a terrible job. You had, to, you had to take a pay cut. You paid it every minute of it. <laughs> and you <laughs> took a pay cut to get that job, did you? Pardon me? You you took a pay cut to get that job, didn't you? Oh, yeah, because I, I was making 75 cents an hour for Sosky Supermarket, and then that all went. And so I I lost I lost everything to do this job, and, and I was stuck with it because I couldn't quit a job that my dad got me, and I couldn't quit a job uh, from a guy who got who graduated from Notre Dame was on the boxing team. Uh, hell, I was stuck with this job without any money and no way to make it up. And and still, I you know I still liked hamburgers and I still liked to go to the Colonial, but I nobody in our family got any money from our parents, so I was stuck with this job. It was absolutely terrible. So when did when did things change? I mean, you were the ball boy, bored. You said bored and depressed, sitting on that little chair. And what happened? Bored, bored and depressed, and uh, and uh, generally angry. Uh, but one day, John Travy, when I had been there for about three weeks, John Travy came into the clubhouse and said that the clubhouse manager for the visiting team was. Uh, drunk and that I would go up and be the clubhouse manager for the visitors uh, for a short time, just to, until they got uh, somebody who was uh, an adult to take the job on. So uh, I, I, delight, I was just delighted to, to get out of the, the uniform that they gave me and go up to the clubhouse and I reported to Jimmy Yule, the trainer for the uh, Kansas City Blues, that, and uh, that I was ready to go to work. So well, that's how I got it. Uh, John Travy just gave it to me, but it was a temporary job. Nobody's going to hire what, what does a clubhouse manager do? <clears throat> well, the main, the main thing is to keep the clubhouse uh, clean. But the, mo the most significant thing that he does is the clubhouse manager for the visiting team is in charge of all the refreshments for all the players. So all the beer and all the pop has to be sold through the to the clubhouse manager for the visiting team so as a result uh, right off the bat i was introduced to the concession people and the concession people wanted to know what my order for beer was uh, for the for the series that was going on for the first couple of days and of course i i for my uh you know, I had no idea what they're talking about. And I told them that my order was the same as the last guy's. But when they gave me the, the bill at, for, for the order that I made, it's, they said, you owe $20. And that $20 has to be paid at the end of the series that we're in now. And, that, and he said, I mean, has to be paid. There's no excuses. 
we don't loan money. We, this is a cash business. You need to pay that money at, at the end of this series. Now, of course, I couldn't pay that money. I had no money to pay it. I couldn't borrow any money. If my whole family got together, we couldn't come up with $20 in cash to pay the, pay that $20 bill. So I was, I was just, I was, the, the Jimmy Ewell said, don't worry about it at the end. The players are going to take care of it and they'll, they'll pay you and give you some, pay you back for the, this. But at that point, I had no idea that I was going to get paid and I had no idea how I was going to pay it back. So, so uh, you were, four, you were 14 years old living in a clubhouse at the, my guess it was probably full of cigarette smoke and beer at the end of the game. Huh? Oh my God, everybody, everybody smoked cigarettes. Uh, you, the clubhouse wasn't just a haze of smoke, it was a fog of smoke. You couldn't see from one end of the clubhouse to the other, but if you could see and look down on the floor, you know what you see? You see chewing tobacco. People would spit that tobacco on the ground. Those players, some of those players <clears throat> just spit that tobacco anywhere. No cups, no anything. Just, you know, just tobacco was just so terrible. It was all over the place. I just hated to clean that stuff up. Yeah, to scrape like, it up, yeah. So with just breathing the smoke and then cleaning up the, the tobacco, I'd say that it was about the worst place you could work as far as the environmental is concerned. It was a but now, terrible. Ed, a lot of these guys, they were these are minor league players coming up through the ranks, right? So a lot of these kids are 18, 19, 20 that you're serving beer to. And you're, yeah. you're 15 without a fake ID, so it, or 14, so it, <laughs> it made kind of an interesting. And then, but you ended up getting the job on a regular basis, right? Yeah, after, uh, you know, uh, I, I, they had a, this electric machine that I ran and that was gonna really gonna be the problem I thought because this machine was a gigantic thing and I, it really ran me, but I, after a while I kind of got used to it and uh, that machine is, was a scrubber and it scrubbed the floors and, and when I got used to it and could, could do it, the clubhouse was always, I thought really, you know, for 14, I thought it really looked good, I mean, uh, but nevertheless, so did John Travy and so did uh, Jimmy Yule, the trainer. They came down every other day and looked at the place. And about three weeks later, they came down and uh, John Travy came down and said that the Blues had decided to hire me full time. And, and I truly, I thought that was the, the craziest management thing I ever heard in my life. I was going to keep the profit from selling the beer. I was going to keep the profit from the coke. I was going to get the tips from the players. And in addition, the blues were going to give me a salary. I thought, well, that's, that is, it, that's completely insane. But I was perfectly, perfectly happy with it. I thought it was terrific. So you were the richest so kid, I, at, I, I, richest I, freshman at Lillis High School, I suspect, huh? Oh, that made me a hero, of course. You know, I was the richest kid in, on 39th Street. <laughs> sure. Now, one of the, one of the, I thought, fascinating things about your book is, is really and it's at the core of it is that you had a lot of interactions with the players not just the visiting teams and i was trying to remember the the in that association those days there was the indianapolis indians the louisville colonels the milwaukee brewers and the st paul saints and the toledo mud hens right yeah so you got to meet not only the players that were visiting but then it, you had to get there as i recall you had to get the, the ballpark early so you you interacted with the uh the old blues players as well yeah and that was a, that was a neat part of the game a neat part of the job because i always got there early and then i always got that clubhouse cleaned early it wasn't because i was such a hard worker i'd say it was because the earlier you got there the sooner you could play catch with the players and you could play catch with the you know the play you could play catch with the blues players and you could play catch with the with the uh visiting team players, I, particularly one guy I really liked was uh, played for St. Paul. His name was uh, Eric the Red Tipton. When he came, <clears throat> he came right off the bat and, and started talking to me about my, he, I, he was a great football player, Eric Tipton was, and he talked to me about, about, about football. And of course, I was telling him about my Lowell's high school, freshman high school team, where I was a starting quarterback. And he was uh, so interested in me uh, and my, what my, my career is at Lillis High School. That, and every time he came into town, which was all the time, every time he came into town, all the time he talked to me about football and, and, and how I was doing and 
the, what plays we were running. So it was, I, I loved him. I had great, great conversations with him. Well, you said now, you said you, it, toward the end of the season, that he, you had kind of a special relationship with him by that time. And what do you do? Well, um, at, at the last uh, game of the series uh, between the Blues and and uh, St. Paul, uh, Eric told me uh, <clears throat> I went on the field to play catch with him like I always do. And, and he said, hey, you can't get on this field with those kind of shoes on. You know, you can't do that. Uh, and of course, I, I didn't have any other kind of shoes. That was all. He said, "Here are some cleats." And so he had some baseball cleats. They were too big for me, but you know, the first time I ever wore baseball cleats, and I was so thrilled to get them. And then, then he did, this was the craziest thing. He came up to me, and he said, uh, "What? What is that thing on your left hand?" And I said, "That's my baseball glove." And he said, "That's that's your your glove." And I said, yeah, and he took it off and threw it in the visitor's clubhouse. And I went, wait, wait a minute. And he said, hold this, hold my glove for a second. So uh, I I held his glove and I, now I'm holding a major league glove. It's so wonderful. Uh, and then he comes back and he he has a brand new glove. And he's and he obviously he's broken in and he's and he, I'm holding his other glove. And he says, well, Eddie, uh, you might as well keep that glove because I, you know, there's no way in hell I'm going to use two gloves. So you keep that glove. And, and so I had this major league glove that I had for years and years and years. And I was so thrilled to get it. You couldn't believe what a, what a thrill that was. And and at the last game of the last game of the series, it was just such a wonderful, wonderful present and gift. I was so happy to get it. I'm, I'm not sure I ever really thanked Eric enough for that. But you, now, anyway. but you, you also had, as I recall, um, now Tipton had was coming, ending a, a, a storied major league career, but then there were the young guys coming up through the Yankee organizations, and uh, some of them are household names, and at least one of them had quite a reputation for being quite a rowdy and uh, uh, you know fist throwing kind of guy. But you saw them a little differently. Well, yeah, we, they in in June, Bill uh, Johnny Mize, he was a terrific player for the Giants at that time, and is a future Hall of Famer. But with Johnny Mize came Billy Martin, and Billy Martin was 22 years old, and he came when he came, everything changed around the clubhouse for the kids there because the kids that worked on the scoreboard, you know, those were those were things you did manually. Kids that worked on the scoreboard, the kids that worked in the concession stands, uh, me, the bad boys, everybody, he called down, everybody come down to the field, we're gonna have infield practice. So he had a fungal bat and he and he lined people up at different bases. I played second base, and then he'd say, Okay, there's a runner on third. I heard the ball, boom, you know, and hit the ball and and you were supposed to react the way he said, now you throw the ball in a second, you throw the ball, whatever. And so he had this infield practice with all these kids, all of the odds teenagers, every day that the that the Blues were in town. And uh, that the sad part about it, he was only there 30 days before the Yankees called him up for their, for their uh, World Series drive, which was going to come up in September. And, and also Johnny Mize, they called him back up. Uh, but Billy Martin was just, he was just, uh, it, when somebody said he managed a lot of teams, the first team he managed was our team. He, <laughs> he, was, he was terrific. I mean, just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Kansas City Rugrats. Well, it's, but you yeah. also got to play catch with one of my idols as a, as a kid, and that was Whitey Ford. And oh. Then, had, to, had to catch the ball from Whitey Ford had to be quite an experience. Well, that, and it was, it was because when Whitey Ford played catch, he, you know, like you expect the uh, ball to come back to you, but he, he threw a kind of a knuckle ball, even when you get, you're only 30 or 40 feet away. I don't know how in the world he could do that, but he, he and maybe, maybe it was just me, but I saw this ball quiver and jump and hop when he was throwing the ball to me. And I, I couldn't believe it, but he was just as generous to play catch with, with me as, and and the other kids there, all these 
any other the other bat boys uh, that were the bat boys that were there. He was just a generous guy with with his time, and were many of the many of the blues and and, and a lot of the visiting teams. There were just you couldn't have been a, a happier happier person than me because I had these wonderful people to play catch with and deal with, and it was it was incredibly wonderful. And that, that, those trips to the ballpark, and you had to, I think they, I don't remember exactly how far it was, but it was like 30 some blocks from your house and uh, took you, kind of took you out of your shell, that little Catholic parish of St. James, and you kind of learned a lot about the city in general while going to and from your games, did you not? Well, I really learned about the city in general because, uh, you know, as a visiting team clubhouse manager, I stayed until the last guy left left the clubhouse. And, you know, you got 20-year-old kids. I, I used to call them kids now, 20-year-old 20, 20 players. They're leaving the clubhouse when they finish drinking beer, uh, you know, so there's no, there's no buses running at 22nd and, and Brooklyn at 12 o'clock or 12.30 or one o'clock at night. So the only way for me to get home, there was no way I could call my dad. He, could, he couldn't possibly drive. And none, none of his other, my brothers had cars. So, you know, the only way home for me was to walk from 22nd uh, to 39th of the sale, which is, you know, two and a half or three mile walk every every uh, time, every when every uh, team was had to leave. It was. So, so yeah, I got to know the city darn very well. What struck you um, about the neighborhood? Well, the, the the neighborhood was in the most dilapidated part of town. You know, it was uh, only uh, African and American lived around the ballpark, and it was a terrible situation. The the there were uh, covenants in all the deeds that prevented. Uh, anybody from uh, any black person from owning or even renting a house except in certain districts and then in addition there is this uh, red lining policy sponsored by the government and and that policy prohibited uh anybody to loan money to or any bank or anybody to loan money who lived in the red line that's where all the black people lived so these houses were all shot to hell and and dilapidated and in bad shape and and the the only the only bright thing was in, in my school in 1949 uh, a girl uh, in, enrolled her name was Pearlene Melton and uh, she was the only black student in in not just Kansas City I'm going to say maybe the only black student in a in a white high school in the state of Missouri I'm not sure about that but I'm. I'm, if she wasn't, she was very close to me. And, and uh, uh, <clears throat> she uh, went to St. Monica's grade school, but then she uh, came to Lois High School. And of course, uh, you know, her, her idol life, life was, I, I can't imagine that as a young, high, a young girl uh, going to a all white school. I mean, she couldn't, she didn't go to dances. There were and no parents were going to invite her over for an overnight. Uh, she wasn't in the pep club or any of the social activities. So she was just it was, it was a tough life. Like she later on became a a lab technician and became an expert in genetics and, uh, uh, and a wonderful person. I asked her once <clears throat> what she learned from. What, what was one thing that she thought she learned from all the white kids there? And she said, well, they taught me how to smoke cigarettes. I, I don't know if that's uh, the uh, only thing she learned, but she, she was just a wonderful person. And I took a lot of guts for somebody like Perlene to uh, finish, go to school and finish there. She was in the National Honor Society and every year and that's, that's the uh, distinction that Perlene had against all the other kids in school, and that was she was just smarter than all of us. But. You had is that uh, you 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 and I were talking about one day too, and and at that time, and just a, a a good example of just the the deep seated segregation that was in place in 1950 was the uh, this old Swope Park pool, the big municipal pool. I I went there as a kid, so did you. 
Oh my God. And can you imagine this pool? I uh, had 8,000 visitors uh, a day at this pool. It cost, it, 1941 is when it was built and cost $500,000. And three black kids uh, uh, tried to get, get into the pool right at this time, 1951. And they wouldn't let him in and closed down the pool to the whole city. We, nobody in the city could swim in Swope Park's pool that had 8,000 swimmers because of these three black people wanted to swim. The, the, and the city put in their briefs that the reason is that it's, it's not proper for races that don't mix socially to mix in a swimming pool. It was the craziest thing I ever heard of. And it was bad for all of us, including you, I'm sure, because you you were not allowed to get get in that pool, and, it, and there was no place to swim. And of course, there's no place to swim for black people ever. You know, so yeah. And the, yeah. The, the irony is that that uh, white white folks at that time would would go patronize um, a lot of the black businesses, the the, the the jazz clubs, or or like Arthur Bryant's and those kind of things. And Arthur Bryant's was just down the street from the uh, the ballpark, right? Yeah, yeah. The Arthur Bryant's was at seven seventeenth in Brooklyn, and the ballpark was at twenty second in Brooklyn. And Arthur Bryant's moved there in 1950, 1956. And when Arthur Bryant's moved there, it just changed the whole complexion of at least barbecue in Kansas City because all the people who who went to the Blues game or the Kansas City A's or the Kansas City Chiefs or the Kansas City Royals uh, <clears throat> stopped at Bryant because it was right at the ballpark and Bryant would wrap up this wonderful meat and this salmon colored paper and uh, wrapping paper, butcher block paper. And you'd, you'd take that to the, people would take it to the ballpark and you'd have that salmon paper all over the ballpark, salmon colored paper from the un, unwrapping of the meat and all these hundreds and thousands of people have gone to all those games through all these years. They they uh, they stopped at Bryant's, and so uh, in the paper last Sunday or two Sundays ago, it said that uh, the publicity from television and radio at the at the Kaufman Stadium was, was what made barbecue famous. But what made barbecue famous was all these hundreds of thousands of people stopping at Bryant's before games. And it was incredibly good. It was when did terrific. you get your first taste of, of barbecue? I had, yeah, Jimmy Ewell came down to the clubhouse one day. He was a trainer, right? He was a trainer. And he came down one day when I was working uh, with my uh, washing machine. <laughs> and he had a, a Bryant barbecue sandwich wrapped in this, this paper. And uh, so I un unwrapped this thing and had Bryant's always included the uh, French fries in it. Now, and so I had this wonderful sandwich and then uh, with with pickles, of course, but no ketchup. You're not allowed, Bryant would not serve ketchup. No matter if you had French fries, it's too bad. You couldn't have ketchup. It, didn't, it was not allowed. And then, so I had that and I had the sauce for the very first time. And, and, I, and if you can get addicted to anything, I'm, I'm addicted to Brian's barbecue sauce. Uh, and I wish you'd stop showing that picture because I'm getting really hungry. <laughs> but, but what, uh, you know, but kind of wrapping it up for a little bit, that was, a you know, one year, I, as you said, the beginning of, of your book, at 14, things just happen. Yeah. And did, but what they happened in such a, uh, a, a an amazing way in such a short period of time, but that had to impact, how did that impact the rest of your life? You had a long and storied career as, a, as an attorney in Kansas City and a, your patriarch of a big family. How did that summer impact your life in other ways? Well, uh, for one thing, meeting uh, all these famous people and finding out that they're just human like the rest of us and just wonderful people, uh, uh, Red Tipton and Martin and another player, Hank Workman, who uh, came, who played uh, all year long and then went up to the Yankees at the end of, to, of all things, replace Joe DiMaggio. Good, good luck, that didn't work. But nevertheless, meeting all those wonderful people and and finding how, how great they were to me and how nice they were to me, it made me uh, feel that humans are great. And he, they, it was just nice to find 
so many wonderful people. I wish that I had a chance to thank all the people that helped me that summer and were so good to me that summer, but I, I, I regretfully say I, uh, my, my uh, thanks to them was very poor. I wish it, I wish it been, it been better. Uh, poor team, we take everything for granted as it's happening, and only look only it only means so much when you look back on it. You know? Yeah, you're right. Uh, but uh, well, that's awesome, uh, Jeremy. You want to open up for questions? Yes, uh, Ed and Pat, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I think we could do a separate program on growing up Catholic in Kansas City, 1950s uh, life in Kansas City. It's, it, it's, uh, this, has been, this has been really fun. And I wanted to uh, invite our audience. Uh, if you have a question for, for Ed, uh, go ahead and put that in the comments. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the first one uh, that's come through. Uh, Ed, what was the most memorable on the field moment for you from your time with the Blues? Well, uh, probably for me, uh, of all things, the most memorable time was uh, to show my ineptness of uh, playing uh, baseball because uh, they asked me to go out and shag uh, balls. And so I, I was, I went out to the outfield and then somebody started hitting long fly balls to me and I couldn't judge any of them. I mean, they were, they were over my head and, and it, I thought I was, you know, a great football player by playing on the freshman football team. I couldn't, I could, that was absolutely the most embarrassing and the most post memorial <laughs> moment I had. It's just, so yeah. I can't oh. say, it, can't say it was a great moment. It was just a memorial. Well, and I have a question as well. The first thing that kind of popped into my head and, you know, 1950, you're working for the blues, you're making great money as a 14 year old, you're hobnobbing with big leaguers and serving them beer and dogs. Did you try to uh, resume that position for the 1951 season uh, or did you just do it just the one year? Yeah, no, I, I didn't attempt to, to do it. I don't know. I don't know why. I guess I I felt that I that my luck had run out at serving beer, and because I was 15, was going to make what I was doing any better. I I thought I might leave well enough alone, so I didn't apply for the job. I wish I would have. I mean, what all they could have said was uh, no. I they, but uh, but I didn't. I wish I would have applied for that job, but I I didn't. Now my of all things, my uh, coach and really great friend, John Smeedler, uh, became the, the, the visiting team clubhouse manager uh, for, the, for the major leagues years later. And uh, we always talked about how fun that job was for him also. Ed, Ed there was, I got a question I, I want to ask you, I forgot to ask you, it was um, the coach in 1950, if I recall, was Jimmy Gleason, GG. Yeah. And he grew up in the neighborhood and went to, he was a star, a multi uh, sports star at Rockers College, now Rockers University. And uh, I knew him as a kid. And he, he, he actually went on later on. I remember he was a, a first base coach for the Yankees for a while. But what, what was it like with him? Oh, he was a great guy. He was, he was just as friendly as he could be. He was just, just terrific. And his son, uh, Jimmy was the bat. He, he became the uh, bat boy for the visiting team. That's one of the jobs that were taken that I, that made me the ball boy, uh, because his son became the bat boy for the visiting team. So it was nice to, uh, to be with his father. And then the son as the, uh, bad boy was just a, a real thrill. Nice, really nice people. Wonderful people. Yeah, Gigi went on to Gleason. They called him Gigi in, in high school and college, and uh, he went on to own the uh, the uh, Southtown Movie Theater and Bowling Alley up on Truce, just uh, what fifty seventh up by the Country Club Dairy, and I think he may have had the Golden Arrow Tavern as well. Yeah, I don't like to talk about the Golden Arrow Tavern. Uh, the uh, I spent uh, I spent some I spent some days uh, giving Jim Gleason some of my money. Oh, well, we won't talk about that then. Thank you. 
Ed, Ed, several audience members are curious. Do you still have the glove that was given to you by a, a Tipton, right? No, I don't have I don't have Eric Tipton's glove. I don't know what happened to it. He hocked it. Rod say I oh, didn't hock it. I you know our in our family it it went to my brother Jim who who loaned it to friends who brought it back and loaned it out and you know yeah. you know you oh, it sure. one time I owned it you know real glove that, yeah. that that was uh, for a long time but it's, I I don't know whatever happened to it I'm sorry. I'm sure it serves several people well after you building those grounders. Uh, this is an interesting question and one that I'm curious about as well. Um, can you talk about how the experience was different with a downtown ballpark? And do you think a downtown ballpark could work today for Kansas City? Well, the, I, I, the experience is different for the downtown ball, ballpark because of Bryant's barbecue, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you had you could go to Bryant's and get the most delicious, wonderful meal uh, for a very inexpensive price, and and be allowed to take it into the ballpark uh, uh, and drinks too, and, and open to open to that. I think that's an experience that you can't re replicate anywhere. So, uh, yeah. yeah, if you could get Bryant's and a downtown ballpark together, it'd be great. There, we, what, we just we, I, I just want one point i want to bring up because uh you know it, the, the angst of a 14 year old and just like being introduced to the world you know all at once in a way when ed was talking about uh having to pay the concessionaire that first time 20 bucks you know and he's of course 20 bucks is like you owe you owe somebody a million dollars when you're 14 and he had no idea that he was going to make the money back to be able to repay it and Ed, some of the things that went through your head were pretty funny. You were, you were a pretty scared 14 year old. Well, right at this time, uh, at, at this time, uh, there was a, a brutal mafia murder that took place right by the ballpark at seven at Truman Road and uh, seven or eight blocks from the ballpark, two of Kansas City's uh mafia leaders uh Gregata Benazio were were murdered with uh, and so I'm thinking uh, I owe this twenty dollars that my time is coming to pay the twenty dollars I have no way to pay it and, and I'm thinking in my 14 year old mind is it possible that the mafia this the, the connected at all with uh, <laughs> With the, uh, with the concession department and would the mafia send people out after me to get my get the twenty dollars or uh, what or even worse suppose they killed me and after they killed me uh, would they try to collect the money from my dad and 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 my dad of course would have a, a perfect uh, answer when they came to get him I mean he'd he'd say something like uh, uh, are you are you you trying what what possibly could my just murdered uh soon to be canonized uh wonderful older boy totally impoverished son possibly have bought that would result in a 20 dollars bill and the gangsters would say five cases of beer mr fitz and that would be that would be the end of it for me i'm sure so uh, that that was a. Uh, I was always worried about paying those paying the concession department back, particularly after that for the first time they loaned the money to me, gave me the credit. That's great. Um, we got some more audience questions coming in. Let's uh, go to those. Uh, this I'm sure this is someone you know. Uh, Ed Big Jim wants wants to ask, what did you do with the baseballs and bats that you brought home from the games? <clears throat> well, that was a that was a blessing uh, because as the one thing as ball boy was, uh, I did had access. So when those bats were broken uh, and, and cracked, those bats were when they cracked, they generally then cracked right down the middle. Those Louisville sluggers cracked, so there'd be two sides. And I had there's a a uh, 
shop class at Lois, the shop at Lois that I could get into and I could glue those bats back together. And when I, when I could do that, uh, you know, and with, I was playing with kids my age in a neighborhood at, at, at 39th and Paseo. So uh, giving those kids bats and, and balls, uh, major league bats and major league balls uh, that I could put together, uh, it was terrific. I had, I had tons of major league bats. When I say tons, I mean like 20 or 30 major league bats. And, and so the kids would say, I want the Billy Martin bat because their names are written on it. Or I want the Johnny Mize bat or I want the blank bat. And they'd pick up these bats. And a lot of these bats were way too heavy for my, my friends to use. But nevertheless, uh, I had access to them and, and uh, put them together. And some not, some not so good. I made lamps out of a lot of them that, that were really nice, you know, baseball lamps. and. Uh, but I, I love to have them and I had, and, uh, I wish I would have kept any, I'm sure my late wife, uh, would, would have by now, uh, figured out a way that 20 baseball bats wouldn't, wasn't going to work at our house, but nevertheless, 20 baseball bats and five kids weren't going to work. So one of us had to go to the bats with the kids, I don't know which. I guess none of those lamps survived either. No. Uh, and someone else uh, uh, requested that uh, you to tell, um, let's see, the a bully story that happened when you were a student at St. James oh. involving a bully. Oh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Well, at St. James, uh, there was a bully. His, his name was Gregory. And he was, he was terrible. He, he would, uh, he'd pick on everybody and they sure as hell picked on me. Uh, and, and I, I, that not, nothing I could do about it and nothing anybody else could do it. But so the first year of sixth grade, uh, uh, a new kid came to our school. His name was, uh, uh, Jim Casey. And, uh, Casey uh, was a goofiest looking guy I think I, I ever saw. He had big ears, freckled, and he had these, uh, he's just laughing all the time. And uh, I, I asked him what his name was the first day of the sixth grade, and he said, Casey. And that was, I said, Casey? Is it Casey? Yeah, just Casey. And uh, so the bully saw an easy prey and came up to Casey and sucker punched him, hit him behind the back and, and knocked him down. But uh, the problem that the Gregory, the bully face, they didn't know, but that Casey <clears throat> mother thought he was so goofy looking that she sent him the boxing lessons. And uh, so she, needed, she knew that Casey was gonna have to defend himself most of his life. And uh, so when he got up from the ground, he turned around and just beat the devil out of the bully. And he, uh, so like uh, hooking up with the mafia, Casey became my best friend from that point on <laughs> and, uh, and uh, remained so. And so he passed away not, not long ago. Glad to, glad to have known him, glad to have witnessed the fight and, and uh, Happy with the outcome. Well, this has been this has been so fun. We've gotten a little bit of everything of baseball and barbecue and bully stories. And I Ed, Ed and Pat, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I, I want to thank our audience. Um, encourage our audience to pick up the summer with the blues. You can pick that up on bookshop.org or really wherever you pr prefer to buy books. Um, also be on the lookout for uh, Pat O'Neill's new book coming out, Ted Sullivan, Barnacle of Baseball. Um, Ed, Pat, thank you again, and and uh, let's do it again sometime. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks very much. That was nice of you. Thank you. <laughs>